uh, Peter, what are you expecting in this container? I'm hoping there's an aeroplane in here, a bright yellow one. So it's a different name, Pete. What's this? It's definitely an A32, not an A22. It's not a replacement for the A22. It's an addition to the range. Oh, see, look at that. Eh? So, first impression, the A32 is quite a different fuselage, a lot more streamlined and internally looks quite different as well. The wing, however, is remarkably similar to the A22. Well, hello from Mike Rudd. Um, many of you in the aviation fraternity might uh, know me through my aviation sections on my YouTube channel. Um, and you will also probably know that I'm a keen Foxbat flyer, having now owned two of them. Uh, probably got over a thousand hours either being a pilot or as a passenger taking photographs. And that's what I do. I love photography. Anyway, it's a new chapter in the life of Foxbat Australia with the launch of a new model, the A32, which actually arrived in Australia a couple of weeks ago and is now flying um, at Tyab. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, get a ride in the new aircraft um, soon after it arrived at Tyab and I thought it was worth sharing some of my views and comments. I guess the first one people will ask is this the end of the Foxbat A22? Well we'll go into that in more detail a bit later. I've made a few notes so um, bear with me if I have to glance down. But I thought I'd start off by saying well what's similar between the two aircraft? Uh, I guess the, uh, the main thing is it's the designer, Yuri. I mean, Aeropract has been uh, operating now for, I guess, close on 20 years. And the A22 has been the backbone of their production very successfully. What an amazing aircraft. And like any inventor, any designer, they're always looking for something new. But uh, without being disrespectful, Yuri travels at his own pace. And that's not quickly. I'm sure he's had the uh, concept of the A32 in his mind for the last seven years and probably in uh, full-time development for the last five years. He doesn't rush anything. He's very, very particular. And um, I do know that uh, they've had one now flying for nearly three years. So it's been well checked out and well developed. <clears throat> the next thing I guess is what are the similarities in the two aircraft as far as design goes? Well, the first and obvious one is they both use the identical wing. The traditional Foxbat wing with um, aerolons or flaperons that go the whole length of the um, rear of the wing um, with the slats, they're the same. Um, the other thing that uh, is also the same is the motor. It still uses the standard 912 um, Rotex engine. And I guess uh, we can also say it's the same propeller, the propeller that appeared on the first Foxbat. Um, and that's the uh, Kiev uh, scimitar shaped propeller. Um, what else? Um, oh, yeah, and the fin. The fin of the aircraft is still the same as well. So there are quite a lot of similarities, and you can probably see on my screen at the back. Uh, the new model, uh, and it does have certainly a resemblance to the existing A22. But then we come to what has been changed, and they are many. And why have they been changed? Well, we'll get to that in due course. The first thing is that we have a completely new fuselage. The fuselage is now a total metal, still, structure, but now monocoque. Uh, no longer does it have the... Um, uh, tubular metal um, frame and that also was part of the engine mounting. Um, it's now a total monocoque, completely rounded fuselage. Uh, with that I'm sure there comes extra cost and more difficulty in building, but we retain all the benefits of having a metal fuselage. And they are many and longevity is one of those things. Easy to repair and also the fact that Metal fuselages are easy to check over and see if there's been any stress. So I like metal and I'm glad that uh, he's stuck with his uh, traditional ideas on this one.
Next we come to the engine itself. That remains the same. It's a Rotax 912 100 horse. Nothing's changed at all, but the engine mount is totally different. Now we've got a monocoque design, um, it has to be a different type of um, mounting. And this has a lot of unique benefits. The first is that the way it's now mounted, it seems to make the engine smoother and quieter. That was one of the first things I noticed when we actually took off. Uh, I guess the other thing that's really uh, changed is that the, the actual hole of the, um, uh, the surrounding canopy around the engine is smaller and much more streamlined. And the other thing you notice is that the openings on the front are now reduced. In fact, there are two radiators, one for oil and one for water. They're now behind each other and they're also enclosed in uh, an aerodynamic cowl, keeping the efficiency of the airflow through the cowl much better. This aids also, of course, the uh, aerodynamic performance of the aircraft. Um, the other thing that you'll notice, just looking uh, here at the one, is we've now got a straight top line. Um, across the wing. There's not that sort of dip as we go through the uh, top of the canopy. Um, and this is uh, again an aerodynamic benefit in uh, keeping a cleaner line in the aircraft. Let's look at now some of the aerodynamic uh, improvements in the fuselage and also uh, the connections to the fuselage of things like the undercarriage. We've got a more streamlined strut and undercarriage, um, they're thinner and wider. And that means obviously less presentation to the airflow and improved um, aerodynamic performance. Also look at the fairings where these connect to the fuselage. They have again been aerodynamically designed to improve uh, drag resistance. Elevator, which is now an all flying elevator, it's no longer um, a um, tailplane and an elevator on the back of it. It's just a, a single moving uh, structure. And this again improves aerodynamic performance. The wheels obviously are a little bit smaller and they're in a new designed wheel spat. Um, that's not an option. You can no longer put the bigger wheels on this aircraft. Uh, it's been designed for uh, a better speed performance. Um, you'll also notice that the little iconic tail wheel that uh, stopped you getting a little bit ambitious on takeoffs and hitting the uh, tail, that's now gone. And you'll notice that there is a, a thinner skid, again uh, minimizing drag. They've really looked at every element. Even if it only creates half a knot advantage, they've taken it. Another thing that has changed, nothing to do with the aerodynamics now, but the actual control system has changed totally. No longer have we got the uh, push rod system. Uh, we've now got a fully cable operated control system with twin yokes. I guess this will appeal to the um, GA uh, pilots among us uh, because that will be quite familiar. And you have been able to have the control yokes on the A22, but now with a substantially different uh, type of control mechanism. Uh, there's also, uh, with the uh, new fuselage, there's a, a bigger belly on the aircraft. It doesn't have that sweep up um, underneath, and that gives you more storage area and uh, in a lower down position. It also, for those that, uh, say, want to carry a sleeping bag or a tent, low um, weight, high volume items, you've got more room now behind the seats if you wanted to carry those um, items. However, the weight remains the same. So um, no weight advantage in this point, but um, uh, you've got more volume, if you like, of room to store things. Uh, the seats, uh, they're pretty similar to sit in, I have to say. Um, they're quite adequate for two hours and uh, you might, like me, prefer to put a cushion on them. That's fine too. But there is now more forward backwards adjustment. So those with uh, shorter legs, uh, including my wife, uh, can now get their legs onto the pedals a lot easier. 
Also, the back of the seats now fold down. There isn't that great big bag behind, uh, so the, the seat will fold down to give you easy access. And there are um, pockets in the back of the seats, uh, so that's got to be a bonus. Comment on the doors. Uh, they certainly fit more integrally into the fuselage, again to minimise any um, loss in drag, and they are slightly smaller, mainly because the the front area of the windscreen is now swept back a little bit more, uh, so the door is slightly smaller. Now, it's a little bit more difficult to get into, but still not a problem. I mean, the A22 has fabulous uh, ability to get in and out of it. Uh, this might have restricted it by 10%. Uh, I certainly didn't have any problem as well. The cockpit itself, because of the now rounded fuselage, is a little bit narrower, particularly the thigh where the seats are mounted, so the seats are a little bit closer together. However, there is a change in outlook from the aircraft. Uh, because it doesn't have these tube metal structures inside, uh, you've now got a clean look uh, over the top of the instruments out of the aircraft. Uh, and it does have a more sports car sort of kind of feel. Maybe also the rake of the seat is slightly further back. Is that an advantage? Well, I find it quite pleasant, I must admit. I sort of felt that I was getting in a racier machine. Now the actual instrument panel housing. That's been redesigned again. Quite clever, actually. It doesn't seem to be quite as confrontational as the existing panel, and it does have pockets either side uh, where you can put you know, various items, and that's again got to be an improvement. Uh, one that maybe they could adapt on the A22 as well, I might add. I'd have to also say that whether it's the engine installation, uh, the more um, aerodynamic uh, way that the aircraft presents itself through the airflow, the aircraft does seem a little bit quieter. Uh, is that a major thing? Probably not, but it's still worth, worth mentioning. So, what does all of this mean? Uh, I guess the first thing is it's going to be more expensive. Um, and you can understand why. There's been an exceptional amount of development, energy, spent on this aircraft. A lot of testing. I mean, serious testing. With things like safety automatically um, being looked at very, very carefully. And uh, this doesn't come for nothing. And it's got to be amortised across many sales in the future, we hope. Um, we also say that the cost of building this aircraft has got to be more expensive. In the fuselage, there isn't one flat panel. Um, the tooling to uh, put this fuselage together is more complicated, I'm sure. I'm not an engineer. You've just got to look at the thing to say it's beautifully made and uh, that comes with a price. It's predominantly a handmade machine uh, still. The outcome, of course. This is what we're all interested in, are we? Um, speed. For those that are lovers of speed, I can genuinely say that we took off from Tayab, uh, we cruised out at about 80 knots in the climb, and we were still maintaining a thousand feet a minute, that's two up, and quite a dollop of fuel on board as well. So this plane performs. It also takes off in six seconds, the same as the A22. No short field compromise at all. And we're now racing up to two and a half thousand feet when we start to level off. And uh, this particular aircraft has got a Dynon sky view. And I'm looking with curiosity, great curiosity, to what's going on with something called airspeed. And as we leveled off very, very quickly, this whizzed straight past 100. It whizzed straight past 110. It went straight past 115. We've got our throttle still set to 5.354 uh, with the Kiev prop. And um, uh, yes, it's a cold winter's day, I admit that, but we went straight past 120. Indicated airspeed was 120, and the TAS true airspeed was about 123. Uh, truly remarkable. Uh, even more was uh, looking at the ground speed. We were actually traveling at um, uh, over 150 knots. There was a hell of a tailwind as well. So we weren't flying in uh, totally calm conditions. 
Uh, and that was kind of amazing. So take away the 120 and say, this aircraft will comfortably cruise at 115 knots at around 5,200 revs. Yes, we'll verify this. Yes, we'll have to get another aircraft to fly alongside, um, but impressive. And um, the other thing you have to say is if you want to go into an economical cruise at 4,800 revs, we were still comfortably doing 100 knots. And uh, 110 knots, the thing is not straining at all at just under 5,000 revs. So uh, the aerodynamic improvement has worked remarkably. But in itself, speed is, um, is okay. I mean, you could design the thing to go 130 knots, but to do that, you've got to put on thin wings, a really confined fuselage, and yes, you'll get to 130 knots, but you will not have um, approach and landing performance. You will lose the stall. And the Foxbat has excellent stall performance, and this one doesn't change. So you go up to 120 knots, right down, actually the stall, the stall speed has been reduced too by two knots. So 27, 28 knots stall speed. That's quite amazing. And we've kept the original wing, which is a draggy sort of high lift wing. Totally amazing. Just shows the importance of good design and good aerodynamics. What you might say is that the design, the look, what does the plane look like, how important that is? Well, most of us like to think we like the look of our aircraft, and you have to say that this aircraft is a little bit more sleek, a little bit more sexy looking, uh, looks a little bit like, actually, quite a lot of other aeroplanes, but um, it is a little sportier. Without a doubt, I think it's a sporty looking aeroplane. Now, A22? Uh, I actually like the A22. It's almost an icon after 20 uh, odd years in service. Um, and it's got a bit of a character. And, uh, well, I, I can go with a sports car look, but I doesn't detract from I like my traditional Foxbat. So, <clears throat> my overall impression. One word, impressive. I'll say it again. It's an impressive aeroplane. And it's going to be liked by quite a few people. And it deserves, from my point of view, I know it's called the A32, it's not a Foxbat, that belongs to the A22, but I'd be quite happy to name the plane, and this has got nothing to do with Peter Harlow and Foxbat, but I just call it the A32 Supersport. Sums it up totally. Okay, so this brings us, um, I guess, into a new market, this new machine. It puts the aircraft head on with companies like Technam. And still substantially cheaper than Technam, but now offering quite a range of a flying envelope that I think uh, that buyers are really going to have to go and consider. And it's a beautifully made aeroplane too, by the way. Uh, this is not a short circuit in um, uh, lower quality for um, uh, getting to uh, the objective. All right, so now let's just talk about um, the A22. Maybe it's no longer a contender. Maybe we should forget about it, but not in my book. Uh, they are two separate aircraft. And uh, let me just run through a few things. Uh, forgive me if I read. I can't remember everything. Uh, I think the A32 is an extension to what is now offered, a market segment in its own right. And it does come slightly more at an expensive price. The A22 provides a similar in-air experience. If you're up in the air to enjoy the view, um, to cruise along and take photographs, just to be up there, well, uh, there's no difference. Um, I get good view out of both aircraft. Both are good for aerial photography. I haven't seen any options listed on the A32 for a photographic door yet and apparently they're not going to make any options available at least for the first 12 months. So the A22 scores with me with my, um, my door that opens for the camera to get through. I actually like to be at around about 70 knots to do my aerial photography, so uh, the Foxbat well accommodates that. I also would say that uh, for people operating out of their paddock, paddock operated strips. 
Um, you don't get the option of a bigger wheel on the A32. That will remain something you can do with the A22. So the Foxbat still wins it for me for people wanting to operate out of their own strip or even to make uh, visits to people who've got their own paddock strips. Um, I've had quite a few occasions where I've got quite a bit of uh, sheep muck all over my plane from landing on farms for getting mud and whatever and I did have an aircraft before I got to meet the Foxbat which had spats and they were just a nightmare in those conditions so uh, if you want to do some of the things I like doing on that side and visit places a little bit more remote bear that in mind. Certainly for farmers stick with the A22. If you're mustering goats or uh, just going out looking for where your um, herd is or you're checking water, um, there's no benefit in paying the extra money in my view. And if you're running a flying school, well, um, maybe the A22 is still a little bit simpler to fly, to learn on. Um, it does its job really well. And are uh, the customers going to pay more to go in a, an aircraft that costs well, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars more expensive. So yeah, flying schools it will remain the same. Nearly at the end of those notes, uh, so I um, hope you're not too bored with all of this. People are new to flying. Uh, they're another category of people where I would tend to say stick with the A22. Uh, the A22 is really forgiving. Uh, some of that drag is actually helping you when you're landing, uh, when you want to slow the aeroplane down. Having that little bit of extra space, I really do like my Y uh, stick control. Uh, it's great for an instructor and it's great for the student, but it also does allow you more room for uh, putting your camera bag between your legs and not having the control yoke in front of you. Not a big deal. The new yoke, by the way, it's uh, quite small, very sensitive, easy to use, and when you pull it back, it doesn't hit your legs, it's not going to hit your passenger. Um, so yeah, they've really thought out the control yokes, but with the cable uh, control system, you ain't going to get the uh, stick at this time. Uh, not for a while anyway, maybe never. Then we uh, look at uh, simple questions. Uh, who buys and why do you buy? I ask this question of everyone who buys an aeroplane. What are you really looking to buy? A means of transport or a means to experience the pleasures of aviation. Just being up there. Think about that one um, and then decide how important speed really is. What are we looking at? Well, if I go for a two hour flight, I'll probably be the 20 minutes before the A22. Uh, how important is that? Um, well, one importance, of course, is they'll use less fuel. Of course, the fuel tank's smaller on the A32, um, so flying time is going to be reduced, but the distance you can get will be the same. Um, well, you'll just have to balance that yourself. I don't have to make all the decisions. I'm just pointing them out. So I'm going to say that uh, from my point of view, there are two separate aeroplanes offering different envelopes and different characteristics, different benefits to our many individual wants and needs, and also our budget. <laughs> That's always an important thing. And um, I have got a question myself. $16,000 in difference uh, means um, I like all these toys. They cost a lot of money. Cameras, video, Editing systems, <laughs> uh, a foreign holiday overseas. Uh, all these things can be bought for $16,000. So you make your own choice on that one. If your budget's really great, no problem. <laughs> anyway, that's over and out from Mike. I hope this is explained. I'm not totally independent. You know, I'm very pro for uh, Foxbat Australia. Uh, I think Peter Harlow is a great sort of a guy, so I don't want to upset him. Um, but if this helps in your decision taking, uh, well, it's been worthwhile. Anyway, over and out from Mike Rudd. Cheers. Happy flying. Good landings.